Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Talking Point. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we are gathered and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. My name is John Tyler and I am the moderator for today's Talking Point. When not completing the role of moderator, I am the Operations Manager for Specialist Clinical Services within our Turning Point Richmond office. And today it is an honour to be introducing Dr James Gooden, who is presenting on Predictors of Cognitive Functioning in Presentations to Addiction Neuropsychology. James currently works at Turning Point and is part of our neuropsychology team. James completed his Doctorate of Clinical Neuropsychology at Monash University. Currently, he is the Senior Neuropsychologist at Turning Point Specialist Clinical Services. Within this role, he provides both delivery of comprehensive neuropsychological assessment, but also contributes to a range of research and workforce development initiatives. He also currently is completing a National Centre for Clinical Research on Emerging Drugs, NCRED, Clinical Research Fellowship. I welcome James and thank him for his presentation today. All right, so thank you very much, John, for that uh, introduction. So today I'll be talking on uh, predictors of cognitive functioning and presentations to our addiction neuropsychology service. And I want to pose the question, are we paying enough attention to modifiable risk factors of cognitive impairment? So I want to start with a quick referral question. So client has difficulties with memory, query ABI due, uh, due to substance use, please assess. Now underlying this referral question, there's a little bit of a stigmatizing sort of perspective or bias sort of view uh, that it must be all the substances. Uh, and when we so if we start thinking along these lines and falling into that trap of, of thinking, uh, it unfortunately can really narrow our perspective around the many other biopsychosocial factors that could, inf could influence cognitive functioning uh, in this cohort. And so my object objective for the talk today is to really um, talk a bit about some of the work that we've doing, uh, research that we've been doing in the clinic here, and also highlight the, the many other factors that could be influencing um, cognitive functioning uh, in these clients, and what we can uh, do to um, identify and then potentially um, manage them as well. So to, to unpack this question a little further, we do need to understand, well, what, uh, do, do they have an acquired brain injury? And essentially that refers to damage to the brain that occurs after birth. And this can have, uh, we can get uh, acquired brain injury from uh, traumatic causes, so, such as a motor vehicle accident, a fall or assault, for instance, uh, and any instance in which there's been some blunt force trauma applied to the head. Now, it's important to note that not all head trauma results in a traumatic brain injury. Um, and so, uh, for instance, in the, in the clinic, we're often looking for head injuries where a person might have been un knocked unconscious for over 30 minutes, and be in a dazed or confused state for over 24 hours, maybe even days or weeks uh, lasting like that. And in those instances, those are the cases in which we're expecting to see some more long-term cognitive difficulties. Whereas for milder injuries, um, those with uh, unconscious for less than 30 minutes, for instance, uh, or very brief losses of consciousness, we generally probably wouldn't expect um, longer-term cognitive difficulties after a few months. Uh, we can also get acquired brain injury from uh, non various non-traumatic causes, uh, such as hypoxic events, um, such as uh, following cardiac arrest, where the blood supply to the brain has been interrupted. Uh, as well, we can get um, injuries from tumors, strokes, or other neurological disorders. And over the long term, over the long term uh, following chronic alcohol or substance abuse as well. Now, what's unique about the, um, assessing in, in the context of chronic alcohol or substance use is, the, is in contrast to these other etiologies, these other etiologies are really quite clearly defined events, uh, and we often have quite uh, much more available uh, measures of severity or, or indices that allow us to assess the, the degree of damage um, and the degree of severity of, of that injury. Uh, whereas for chronic alcohol and substance use, uh, it's much more of an, an arbitrary line, and it, there aren't really much uh, clear guidelines in regards to the point at which we might de declare that a person has, say, an alcohol-related brain injury. Uh, and in terms of trying to understand the threshold at which we reach this point, um, there aren't too uh, many in the way of uh, criteria available. Um, 
we do, we do have some criteria available in the DSM, um, which has a substance or medication-induced neurocognitive disorder. Um, and the criteria for, for this condition include that uh, impairments do not occur just during, um, during delirium and must persist beyond intoxication and acute withdrawal. The substance or medication must be capable of producing the impairment. The temporal course of deficits is consistent with the timing of, um, of use uh, and abstinence. Uh, and the deficits can't be attributable to another condition or disorder. Now, when we start applying this criteria in the clinic, however, we can do start to encounter some issues, particularly, uh, I think, unique to the drug and alcohol space. So first up, for example, for this persisting beyond intoxication and acute withdrawal, uh, it's interesting to note that we don't actually have any good clear guidelines about uh, how long these withdrawal uh, and periods must last um, before we start can do an assessment to start detecting more, what we would consider more persistent de uh, def uh, deficits. Um, so instead, we often rely on maybe um, some uh, arbitrarily kind of defined um, neuropsych rules of thumb, perhaps, such as maybe four weeks after abstinence of, of abstinence um, to, uh, to conduct these assessments to try sort of wash out the effects of withdrawal. Um, another practical consideration is the fact that uh, in many cases, it may be very, very challenging for individuals to obtain this level of abstinence. Uh, and for some individuals, it may be uh, entirely uh, uh, infeasible uh, uh, to engage in, in this level of abstinence in the first place, uh, which makes it a real challenge to provide this diagnosis in the context of ongoing use. Uh, another limitation is this uh, uh, notion around substance or medication being capable of producing the impairment. Now for alcohol, we know that there's really good, clear evidence around the long-term um, harmful effects of heavy sustained alcohol use on cognitive functioning. And this is measured in terms of a dose-response relationship. So you know, the heavier and more sustained that use, uh, the more likely and more severe those cognitive um, def deficits can, can be. Um, however, when it comes to measuring the effect of other substances, uh, this is where things start to get a little bit more, more murky. Uh, and when you start unpacking the literature, things aren't exactly as clear as potentially we would like them to be. And I can touch on some of the reasons why that is the case as well. And finally, when considering the, um, uh, this uh, criteria around being not attributable to another condition or disorder, um, this, it, when we apply this, it becomes quite tricky considering the extremely high rates of clinical comorbidity that are present in drug and alcohol contexts. So we know rates of mental health difficulty, complex trauma presentations, uh, other me untreated medical conditions, and so on, can all significantly impact a person's cognitive functioning and presentation. Um, and these are very, very common conditions that are very, uh, very frequently present uh, in, in addiction contexts. So this, again, this makes it quite challenging to apply this criteria um, accurately. Uh, for the sake of completeness, um, for the ICD-10 does also have some criteria around a neurocognitive disorder, um, largely stratified according to um, different substances uh, and whether the, the def deficits are considered amnestic or non-amnestic. But I have to say they are sort of equally sort of vague and, and quite um, challenging to apply in day-to-day -day clinical contexts as well. I touched on some of those research limitations in terms of the different substance use literature as well. And so what some of the challenges that we have is um, the inconsistent use of measures and the interpretation of these measures uh, across different studies. Uh, so for instance, study A uh, might be measure executive functioning in terms of a set switching task, whereas study B might use a, cognitive, a measure of cognitive inhibition. Um, and they, both studies, for instance, might conclude that there are impairments in executive functioning um, or present different, different patterns of findings, for instance. And so it can make, quite, uh, make it quite challenging to extrapolate these um, results and, and, and review the consistency of them across um, studies and, and different methodologies. And it's worth noting that these differences in tasks have an, can have entirely different neuroanatomical correlates. Another challenge that we have is also a lot of the research literature tends to include research-based measures of um, various cognitive domains or, 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 or skills. Uh, so, for instance, we might have a, a paper that describes cognitive functioning in terms of things such as uh, decision making or delay discounting or multiple measures of impulsivity, for instance, using measures that we would generally not use in day-to-day -day clinical practice. 
So this can make it quite challenging for us in terms of applying the findings of these research studies into our, our, our clinical practice and knowing what to expect for individuals with certain substance use histories. Another problem as well is that is the prevalence of all these other factors that could influence cognition uh, in drug and alcohol contexts, such as mental health, trauma, or various unstable um, or, or stressful psychosocial factors. Um, and a lot of research studies might either um, sort of properly fail to account uh, or co-vary for these factors uh, or deliberately exclude them from their sample. And for studies that really heavily exclude a lot of these variables, then we do start to have issues around whether the sample that are, samples that are used in uh, research are in fact representative of um, the day-to-day the -day clinical um, context and, and the individuals that come through our clinic doors. And a good example of this is the fact that uh, in terms of uh, AOD use, uh, everyone knows that polysubstance use is the norm rather than the exception. Uh, however, if a lot of research studies only isolate individuals who've used uh, one particular substance, uh, then this sh may not be, the findings may not be representative of, of the kinds of clients that are coming through us, uh, particularly when there's multiple substances uh, using at the same time. So in the, in the clinic here, we're often asked to diagnose acquired brain injury from head injuries or substance use, for instance. Uh, and our clinical impression over the years has been that uh, our clients referred are often far more complex than what's detailed in that uh, original referral question, such as the referral question that I, po I posed at the very start here. Um, and the more we unpack some of these referrals, the more we find that there are often many factors that are clouding this clinical picture that may prevent a diagnosis from being reached. Uh, and it's also possible for um, some of these factors to be modifiable risk factors for cognitive impairment, um, meaning that if we actually address them potentially prior to an assessment, we might actually yield some different or potentially better results. Uh, so rather than just rely on our anecdotal impressions and, and gut feel, we wanted to see well, what the data was telling us. Um, so we set about reviewing um, uh, uh, all of the clients that we've seen in the clinic in the last um, few years. So this included 200 case files seen of, of clients seen between 2014 and 2018. We extracted all of the clinical histories, assessment scores, neuropsychology opinions, and any new diagnoses conveyed as well. And this work was recently published in Drug and Alcohol Review in the middle of last year. So I'll step through some of the findings of this work and, and some of the main, uh, yeah, the main results from this one. Uh, first up, in terms of referral criteria both for the clinic and therefore our study overall, uh, we do only see individuals who are aged over the age, age of 18 uh, and have a history of pa a past or current history of significant alcohol or substance use. So we do only see individuals with you know, heavy histories, for instance, heavy histories of daily uh, use for several years, uh, rather than those who've just had a little bit of experimental use over time. Um, individuals can't be referred for decision-making capacity or other medico-legal reasons. And all referrals undergo a secondary consultation prior to assessment to explore the presenting cognitive concerns, specific referral questions, and the stability of their presentation as overall. So we do want to ensure that we're timing an assessment for what is, represents a really good time for them to, to undergo uh, an assessment. And we do try to avoid any um, you know, acute crisis presentations as well. As well, we are a community-based uh, service, so individuals do have to do well enough to attend um, our um, offices here in, in Richmond and, and functional enough to be able to make it here um, either with a bit of support or independently. So this is not a sample in which uh, we, we are seeing anyone who's, who might be so unwell that they need to be admitted as an inpatient uh, or are, you know, need to be seen as an inpatient uh, in the hospital. Uh, for any neuropsychologists in the audience, this is our, our core battery of, of um, tests that we would uh, typically use. Uh, of course, this is subject to uh, um, clinician preference as well. So over the years, there were some variations in, in the general um, tests that individuals preferred to use. Um, and, but this is generally what, was con what we considered to be the most consistent battery. Uh, so we've got measures from the WACE, um, including verbal, nonverbal intellectual functioning, working memory, processing speed, as well as measures of verbal memory, visual memory, and executive function as well. Uh, for our sample demographics, we had a mean age of 39 years, um, with individuals ranging between the age of 19 to 64, and 75% of the sample were male. Uh, 
Uh, 61% of individuals had less than 10 years of education, and we do find this to be quite a striking finding um, in that you know, compared to the normal population uh, and rates of school completion, this number is far lower than, than the general population. As well, 57% uh, of individuals were unemployed at the time of assessment and therefore are reliant on, on government benefits or, or new, the new start allowance, uh, whereas 22% were on the disability support pension. In terms of the clinical uh, characterization of, of presentations, 71% uh, of the sample had a history of a formal mental diagnosis uh, in their past or, or, um, or that was currently active. Um, and this is very consistent with a lot of past literature showing the very high rates of mental health difficulties uh, and comorbid conditions in, in drug and alcohol contexts. As well, around about 40% had a history of complex trauma. Um, and I do wonder whether that this is, is, represents an, an underestimate of the true figure, uh, considering that we were reliant on either that information being available in, in previous documentation uh, or individuals actually disclosing that history to us, uh, to effectively to a clinician that they'd met for the first time on that day. Uh, so we do wonder whether that's a bit of an underestimate, and I have seen some research in other contexts uh, where that figure is as high as 80% as well. Uh, for our figure, it does include um, child and adult um, uh, uh, experiences of a complex trauma. Uh, in terms of suicidal ideation, around about 35% had reported a history of active ideation, uh, uh, of past ideation, and 7% reported active ideation at the time of assessment. So even though we try to time the assessment to best suit the individual um, and ensure that, that no one's presenting in sort of a state of acute crisis, this figure really sort of highlights that uh, the level of sort of chronic passive emotional distress and difficulty that these individuals are living with. Around about 40%, 41% had a history of head trauma over the loss of consciousness. Uh, not overly surprising considering that this is one of the risk factors that we'd be evaluating as part of our assessment, uh, as part of referral and triage. However, what is always surprising to me was the, the figure around 19% having untreated hep C especially considering how good available treatments currently are. 21% had a history of overdoses over the years, and 11% of these had multiple overdoses in their history. And because we are a service that are willing to see individuals who are still using at the time of assessment, around about 29% were using daily still. In terms of substance use, the most, it's no surprise that the most frequently used substance was alcohol. Around about 60% of all uh, individuals attending uh, having used alcohol daily in the past. Uh, this was followed by cannabis and then methamphetamine or amphetamine type stimulants, uh, lastly followed by uh, heroin. And again, that's fairly common, uh, consistent with, uh, with past literature as well. In terms of neuropsychological functioning, uh, so this figure shows the proportion of clients are scoring 1.3 standard deviations below population norms for each cognitive domain. So effectively, uh, within the, uh, uh, the uh, borderline or extremely low levels of, of uh, categories of impairment, um, all representing sort of up to about the eighth percentile. Um, so what you can see on this is that you know, for, for divided attention, for instance, their ability to um, think flexibly and switch between um, the competing sets of information, just over 50% of the sample were struggling, uh, and, uh, struggling with this task, um, highlighting the, the, the degree of difficulty and complexity uh, of this task and um, the, the nature of, of their difficulties being that uh, more higher order cognitive domains are where one that individuals are having more difficulty with. And consistent with this, uh, measures of verbal and visual memory are also more frequently impaired. Uh, lastly, followed up by uh, measures of processing speed uh, and verbal intellectual functioning. Uh, in contrast, the, uh, an area of strength, particularly for this group, was, uh, it was in terms of nonverbal intellectual functioning. So being able to work with hands-on information and solve puzzles and work in that visual domain. And this is probably reflective of the fact that individuals would, um, are probably more likely to be, um, have, have experience in terms of uh, hands-on roles such as trade or labor hire and, uh, and working in that hands-on environment um, and probably less likely to have higher rates of school completion um, Whereas, you know, for, you know, for instance, for verbal skills, which are highly dependent on, on education skills. Um, 
In terms of new diagnoses conveyed as a result of the assessment, we were able to con um, convey a new diagnosis in around about 25% of cases. Uh, so this included the provision of acquired brain injury diagnosis in around 13% of cases, as well as identifying traumatic brain injury as well. Uh, the figure that always gets me is the rates of uh, developmental language disorders and learning disorders such as reading disability and even identifying an intellectual disability as a result of the assessment. And this is particularly notable because we are an adults only population with a mean age of 39 years. Uh, so, in a, and the, whereas these are pervasive developmental conditions, um, so they've, they're something that these individuals have had their entire lives that they were born with, uh, and they haven't been identified throughout their entire childhood and schooling and educational experience right into adulthood, and in some cases, you know, many years into adulthood. So it really highlights um, how these individuals have fallen through the various cracks of society um, and landed and had sort of long-term difficulties uh, in their, um, in their uh, developmental abilities. Uh, and indeed, at times, it, 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 there have been referrals where individuals have queried, oh, is there an acquired brain injury in this case? And it was actually just because they couldn't read. They had a reading disability, and so they weren't able to read the information, and that's why they were having difficulties. And it was just something that no one had actually picked up on. Uh, in terms of the more general neuropsychology opinion, so including anything that was uh, previously diagnosed as well, um, this sort of shows um, a breakdown of those opinions. Um, and you can see that you know, in about 40 to 14% of cases, we conveyed uh, an acquired brain injury, um, as well as traumatic brain injury in 5% in of cases uh, as well. Um, and what was, uh, I think, particularly interesting from this group as well is there was a group that uh, were good news stories, so around about 16% of the group, uh, presented with fairly unremarkable or normal neuropsychological profiles, and we weren't able to convey any new diagnoses. And these were the good news stories where people were actually doing fairly well. And so we, we do really enjoy giving those feedback uh, sessions and that, that kind of feedback. Um, what was also sort of interesting is this uh, category of multiple contributing etiologies. Uh, and so this is a group where things are so kind of, there, there's so many factors at play that we weren't actually able to make a formal diagnosis, uh, which is around about 25, almost 25% of cases. Uh, and so it shows that uh, when there's lots of unmanaged factors or multiple potential competing etiologies, it really does impact our ability to convey a formal diagnosis. Uh, in these cases, we really just have to describe what's happening, describe the various factors at play, and admit that we don't actually know which ones are, are, are the most relevant at the time, apart from recommending that you know, which, which ones we can um, make referrals and, and recommend treatments for. Um, as well, to be expected, there were um, uh, contributions of those with mental health difficulties as well as active substance use. And so collectively for this group, uh, this sort of show, this is kind of the group where there are other factors or at play that potentially could be better managed. And if they were to be better managed, then we may have a better idea of an ability to convey a more formal diagnosis. Uh, so it was these figures that we wanted to kind of unpack a little bit more and really explore, well, well, what actually are the contributing um, variables and, and the individual contribution of these variables to cognitive functioning? So that led us on to our second paper, which really aims to identify the individual contribution of biopsychosocial variables to cognitive functioning in individuals attending our service. Uh, so we set out to explore uh, various uh, variables, including demographic variables, uh, substance use, medication sedative load, as well as the presence of various clinical diagnoses, and want to explore the individual contribution of these variables to cognitive functioning. Now, it is worth noting that this paper is currently um, is still unpublished and it's uh, in progress at the moment, um, so we are slowly progressing through that review process. Uh, what was unique to the study was the inclusion of a sedative load index. Uh, so this is a calculation to allow us to um, de get a rough determination of the overall sedative load based on the number of medications that a person might be prescribed. So group one medications are classed as your primary sedatives and are given a rating score of two. And these include your anesthetics, anxiolytics, hypnotics and sedatives for instance. A group two medications are those uh, with medic um, medications with a sedating uh, component uh, or a prominent adverse effect for sedation. Uh, and these include some analgesics, some anti-epileptics, 
as some addictions medications such as methadone, for instance. And these are all given a rating score of 1. Uh, so, for example, if an individual is prescribed diazepam, metazepine, and methadone, for instance, they would get a total rating score of 4. Um, so it's worth noting that uh, this doesn't take into account dose, but it does allow us to um, consider the potential interactions of multiple sedating medications on a, on a person's profile. So for this analysis, we used a series of multiple regressions with the predictive variables and performance on each cognitive domain as the outcome. Uh, each predictive variable was tested independently with candidates identified at point 0.2, uh, point 2, and candidate variables were then tested in um, preliminary multivariate models in a stepwise manner to examine their contribution and overall fit to the model. Uh, and that allows, allowed us to determine a, a final outcome um, model for each variable. Now, we'll say that I would consider these models to be fairly exploratory in nature. Um, and as we progress through the, the, the review process as well, we may need to uh, address some uh, as well, some limitations in the data. So um, we do want to exercise a, a degree of caution in interpreting these as well. In terms of results, so the demographics are, are, are pretty much the same as uh, the original paper, given it's the same sample. Um, I did want to flag in terms of substance use. We used variables for uh, age of first use, the number of current uh, substances currently used uh, daily, as well as the number of days of abstinence uh, in the sample. In terms of sedative loads, we found that 55% had a score of one or more, and 29% had a score of three or more. So in other words, this, this group had uh, were prescribed at least two medications with sedating properties. And the most commonly prescribed med medication was diazepam uh, at 17%, followed by methadone. Um, the one other addition variable was uh, DAS total score, which is effectively the, the total score from the depression, anxiety, and stress scales, uh, where each of the individual um, scales were, were totaled to get a, a final um, total score. So that's what we used in these analyses. In terms of the regression models, uh, so for verbal intellectual functioning, um, we found significant, uh, an overall significant model uh, accounting for 19% of the variance. Uh, with education, the presence of a developmental diagnosis, and emotional distress or impacting performance. Um, so meaning for every year of education, performance was improved, uh, as well for each you know, for heightened symptoms of emotional distress, this had a negative imp impact on performance, as did the presence of a developmental diagnosis. Uh, for nonverbal intellectual functioning, we had contributions uh, from uh, being female, uh, having um, more years of education has been uh, as, as resulting in better performance, as well as the presence of an acquired brain injury diagnosis was associated with worse performance. Um, for processing speed, we had con significant contributions from age, uh, being female, uh, resulted in better performance. Um, better years of it, more years of education resulted in better performance as well as heightened emotional distress was again associated with negative, uh, reduced performance. Uh, sneaking in at 0.05 was uh, the days of abstinence, so just on the cusp of significance there, um, where uh, fewer days of abstinence were associated with better performance, and I can kind of talk to you a bit, of, a bit about why I think that variables come up as well. It was interesting that age came up as well for, as, a, as a variable, considering that is that age is usually controlled for uh, in these, uh, this data set already. For working memory, we found um, contributions from the presence of a developmental diagnosis impacting performance, as well as heightened emotional distress. Uh, for vo verbal memory, again, the presence of a developmental diagnosis impacted performance, uh, and this was offset with an interaction with education. So meaning for, for individuals with a developmental diagnosis, every year of education they had completed was effectively a protective factor and resulted in, in, in some slightly better performance and, and offset that initial impact. A really interesting model came up for divided attention uh, where we found um, increased sedative loads and heightened emotional distress were both negatively influencing performance on this task. Uh, and finally, for cognitive inhibition, being able to uh, your control in, uh, um, automatic responses, uh, we had contributions from age, the presence of a developmental diagnosis, as well as that interaction between having developmental diagnosis and years of education as a bit of a protective factor there too.
So in summary, in addition to the contributions of age, um, sex and education, uh, higher emotional distress predicted um, better performance uh, or worse performance on um, information processing speed and working memory, as well as verbal skills and divided attention. Higher sedative loads also predicted worse performance on a measure of divided attention. And having a developmental disorder predicted verbal skills and working memory, as well as verbal memory and cognitive inhibition based on an education, uh, that interaction with education. And having an acquired brain injury impacted um, nonverbal skills. Our variables for mental health diagnoses, trauma, hep C, and current substance use were not significant in the current models. So what does this all mean and what can we take away from it? Well, firstly, our findings support the view that many biopsychosocial factors can influence cognitive test performance in drug and alcohol clients, not just substance use. Um, and we find it particularly concerning as well, considering that many of these factors can be considered modifiable, um, such as multiple sedating medications or heightened emotional distress. Um, and it's interesting considering that you know, the impact of both of these variables has been previously well established in other populations. So it's not, exactly, it's not a novel finding by any means. However, I think it's particularly important to demonstrate in this, uh, in this cohort um, because of the pervasive nature of stigma and discrimination that exists in drug and alcohol context and that easy trap to fall into of thinking, oh, it's just the substance use. And in actual fact, there may be some very um, easily identifiable and very modifiable risk factors that could be influencing an individual's presentation. In terms of sedating medications particularly, um, it's concerning considering that these are very highly prescribed medications in drug and alcohol populations. And they're prescribed often very, um, very much contrary to the clinical guidelines um, and are well associated with increased risks of overdose and death. Uh, benzodiazepines in particular um, have been shown to be associated with long-term cognitive outcomes. Uh, and so we're, we're concerned that these may in fact represent a wholly preventable risk factor for cognitive difficulty uh, in this cohort. Uh, and that's on, in addition to those uh, increased risks of overdose and death. And so that's why we really do want to emphasize the need for that multidisciplinary input uh, and appropriate consultation with uh, addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry, for instance, to ensure that these medications are appropriately prescribed over the long term in these cohorts. Some of our other findings um, point to the contribution of uh, developmental histories um, and that early adverse life of, um, adversity, uh, adverse events uh, and levels of education as being highly important to consider in these cohorts. Um, and we're wondering whether education may be a proxy for some of these early life events. Uh, meaning for those with um, you know, lower levels of educational attainment, uh, they may struggle, may have struggled to, um, or had you know, um, family issues or other um, difficulties growing up that may have interrupted their schooling and led to a lower quality um, educational attainment, and that could reflect some of their difficulties um, on the current on the current findings. As well, we know the presence of neurodevelopmental conditions are, are, um, have a higher prevalence in drug and alcohol contexts. And so we do need to be very mindful of, of the potential uh, for these conditions to be present. Um, and th we know as well that um, uh, there are s some potential predisposing cognitive weaknesses that may, um, may mean it, make individuals um, become more susceptible or vulnerable to um, a substance use and addiction uh, in later years as well. Um, so those pre-morbid and developmental histories do need to be really carefully considered um, and it may just be that they've always had those weaknesses rather than them being acquired over time or necessarily due to substances or something else. It was interesting that age came up as uh, predictive of being slow, of slow pro uh, information processing speed and cognitive inhibition, considering that all these tests are already corrected for age. And so we were wondering whether this might reflect a degree of cumulative cognitive impairment over time or potentially premature aging, or may even be a proxy for years of use, for instance, or, or the cumulative burden of, uh, of these um, uh, impactful psychosocial histories as well. Um, that variable for uh, days of abstinence was interesting as well, considering that came up for predictive or being predictive of information processing speed. Uh, and I do wonder whether that might reflect uh, our triage process, for instance, uh, considering that uh, we would generally uh, you know, 
almost prioritize an individual who was presenting with cognitive difficulties in the context of abstinence because that would be a significant red flag for, for an assessment. Um, and so yeah, I'm not convinced that this uh, days of absence variable uh, is overly helpful considering our, our triage process. And that may be, may be why that finding came up and, and snuck in at 0.05 significance there. In terms of the limitations overall, well, we do have to acknowledge that this is messy clinical data um, from a sample of convenience. Um, and as I indicated, it is inherently biased in, towards those with more complex issues and suspected cognitive impairment. We do make no apologies for the need to triage those individuals for an assessment, um, but it does make, have implications for, uh, for some of this data as well. And importantly, coding and quanti uh, quantifying the severity of all of these complex issues uh, is inherently difficult. And um, I'd argue probably not all that feasible at all to, to wrap up all these complex relationships into a nice, neat little regression model with the available variables. Um, so we do have to recognize the limitations on that front as well. We do note as well they were missing data present, uh, present throughout due to selection of assessment procedures and available information at the time as well. Um, so I do want to note that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence in this context. And just because some variables didn't come up as being significant doesn't mean that they're not important or relevant for an individual's current cognitive functioning. Um, and unfortunately, it is going to come down to a case-by-case -case basis in reviewing the potential contribution of all of those histories. And finally, it's worth noting that uh, this is a community-based sample rather than a hospital sample. Um, so we don't tend to see individuals who are so severely impaired that they are you know, requiring inpatient care or assessments of decision-making capacity, for instance. Uh, so this is a very sort of defined um, group in terms of a, a clinical um, community-based group. Um, Importantly though, well, what happens if we uh, don't consider these factors? And these are some of the questions that I want to pose to you today. Um, firstly, uh, we need to consider the, the risk for cognitive impairment uh, impacting treatment engagement. If we don't correctly identify um, cognitive impairment or difficulties, these may have real tangible uh, impacts on a person's ability to effectively engage in treatment and benefit from the treatment programs that they want to engage in. Um, another concern is that uh, many mental health difficulties or really prominent concerns might be completely misdiagnosed or potentially left entirely untreated. And again, unfortunately, we have seen this in the clinic where very prominent and severe mental health difficulties uh, were almost uh, ignored in favor of, a, um, of, of another label or another diagnosis. Uh, and really to take um, your careful examination of that client's history uh, to tease apart those issues and identify those concerns. So we do want to make sure that you know, any identifiable um, uh, treatment needs are, 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 can be identified and, and managed. Um, and if these, aren't, these factors aren't well managed, they can significantly impact on our ability to accurately diagnose other neuropsychological conditions. And as we highlighted in that first paper where you know, there was this 24% you know, of individuals where there were so many competing etiologies, we effectively couldn't make a formal diagnosis or a final call. Um, so it has real clear and tangible impacts on our ability to provide a diagnosis. And this has then flow-on effects for the impact on eligibility for NDIS or DSP, for instance, or access to other more appropriate services. And finally, I want you to consider, well, the impact implications of a misdiagnosis. And imagine being told that you have a brain injury and you're an incurable permanent condition, but it was actually just your medications that was impacting on your, your functioning. Or imagine the converse, where um, you, you felt for years and sought help of, around concerns around having an acquired brain injury, but everyone just kept telling you and dismissing your concerns and stating that, oh, it's just due to the substances. Um, and I've got a good uh, example here from a, a referral to our clinic, whereas a, a client was referred for assessment following a psychiatry review. And they were presenting with cognitive difficulties, including poor concentration and attention, and they were in rehab and early remission from polysubstance use. They were experiencing had a significant trauma history, uh, had poor emotional regulation and features of a personality disorder. And the assessing psychiatrist quite rightly was concerned about these cognitive difficulties and made a, a recommendation for a consultation with us. Um, and also as part of their recommendations, recommended an adjustment of uh, the client's medications to spread that dose um, throughout the day to help reduce the fluctuating arousal. Um, 
And by the time we, we um, had conducted that secondary consultation um, with the, the, the support worker for that individual, uh, they, that inv they reported that the, the client no longer had any cognitive concerns as they felt more emotionally regulated. So this was a wonderful example of the, the impact of making a, you know, a tweak to the client's medications, having a very tangible impact on their, their experience of cognitive uh, difficulty and cognitive functioning. And so that referral was withdrawn and there was no need to progress it any further. Now that said, it could have gone a completely other way and um, that psychiatrist could have, um, you know, have picked up on the early, early signs of you know, an acquired brain injury uh, or a, you know, an underlying uh, developmental condition if that client had uh, exhibited persistent cognitive concerns despite those, uh, that medication making and the, uh, uh, despite that medication uh, making some adjustments to their experience of emotional regulation. So it could go both ways, but this was a great example of, of a good outcome for that individual. So the longer that we work in this space, the more and more this quote from a paper in 2011 um, strikes home. And that it's that substance addiction might be viewed as a marker for a whole cluster of educational, occupational, and health-related factors that negatively impact uh, neuropsychological performance. So where do we go from here and how do we address this? Well, from my view, it's the need for holistic, multidisciplinary care and really strongly advocating the need for individuals with addiction uh, histories to be able to access this level of care. Um, and the Addicted Australia TV series uh, was a really good uh, example of what that model could look like with the right level of funding and support. And if you haven't caught the series, I do encourage you to watch it. Uh, for individuals who are more neuropsychologically compromised, um, I would encourage, uh, I would argue for uh, um, this needs to go several steps further. Uh, and we need to start modeling and looking at uh, ways to improve access to the wider range of allied health and multidisciplinary um, rehabilitation input, you know, such as that better access to uh, occupational therapy, uh, physiotherapy, uh, social work, clinical psychology, neuropsychology, as well as uh, addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine. Um, to really uh, draw on the wealth of expertise in, in neuro rehab context and that could be very easily applied to individuals in this cohort. Um, so if you are working in either policy development or at the service provider level um, and you have an opportunity to advocate for better access to um, these kinds of disciplines, I would really encourage you to explore ways to allow individuals in this cohort to, to access these kinds of services because I do believe it is sorely, sorely needed. Uh, hand in hand with this, I um, we, we do need to do a lot to address and, uh, the, and reduce issues around shame and stigma and discrimination that are so pervasive in uh, addiction cohorts. And that's why the Rethink Addiction campaign that's running at the moment is so uh, important. And from a neuropsych perspective, what really worries me uh, is that uh, the delays in treatment seeking, um, often due to um, issues around shame and stigma, for instance, uh, could potentially mean a difference between a person having an alcohol-related brain injury or not. Uh, and that's really quite worrying for me. And finally, in terms of clinicians working with AOD clients, we really need to emphasize the need to be mindful of the range of presenting issues and how they all may impact experiences of cognitive difficulty. And if you ever get into start falling into the trap of thinking, oh, it must just be the substance use, I do encourage you to take that step back just briefly and reflect on, well, what if it's not? Um, what other factors might be relevant here and how would this potentially change my level of care? And just allow yourself to go down that, um, that line of thinking briefly to explore if there are potential other options. In terms of our practice recommendations from our clinical um, findings, I would want, uh, emphasize the need to exercise caution in labeling addictions cohorts with ABI or TBI prior to assessment. Uh, and really want to encourage that uh, the, the risk of some of these um, labels just you know, sticking on medical records. And we've had plenty of instances where we've seen these labels stick over you know, each presentation. And the further back we go, we realize that this was not really based on good, clear evidence or good, clear critical thinking. Uh, and those uh, labels can have significant implications, again, for the way people uh, cons uh, formulate or consider the various other factors that may be at play. And within this, we want to ensure that modifiable risk factors for cognitive impairment are managed as best they possibly can. 
considering the very high risk and prevalence of them occurring in these cohorts as we've, as we've demonstrated. Uh, and these have very tangible impacts on both the client's experience of day-to-day -day functioning, but also our ability to, to engage in further assessment as well. And lastly, absolutely refer to neuropsychology should there be ongoing concerns or any questions on this front. Uh, and then saying that, I do recognize that accessing appropriate neuropsychology services is very challenging, um, considering often very lengthy wait lists um, or, or um, the limited sort of public services available. Um, so again, if you're working in that policy level and you have an ab ability to influence um, you know, hiring of neuropsychology or developing business cases for, for these types of disciplines, uh, I would strongly encourage you to, to pursue that because um, there, this, again, this is an area that is sorely needed and we absolutely need more, um, more staff on the ground on this front. For us as neuropsychologists, we also need to um, do our bit and we need to be, think very carefully and uh, flexibly about how we can best meet this demand uh, considering you know, the incredible demand for, for assessments in these cohorts. So one of the things that we've done at Turning Point recently is we have adu um, uh, ad adapted our model of care to offer secondary consultation within several weeks of referral. Uh, and this is where we can provide advice on the appropriateness of referrals clarify any presenting issues and offer interim recommendations um, uh, for, for clients. Uh, and this is where we can really work with, um, work with the referrers to help develop a plan um, and help them to support the client maybe while they're on the wait list for, for an assessment. And our colleagues in New South Wales have also been doing a lot of really great work. Uh, and this includes um, following a three-stage approach, uh, including training up other clinicians, to explore those risk questions around risk factors for cognitive impairment, conduct some basic cognitive screening, uh, and then consult and, and bring all those findings back to a, a consultation with neuropsychology to collaboratively, collaboratively determine uh, whether formal assessment is required. Um, so that is a really great model as well. Uh, I will shout, that, shout out that we do have our Managing Cognitive Impairment uh, in AOD Treatment Guidelines um, in, in the final stages of development. Uh, so this will be made available on our Turning Point website once it is published. So do keep an eye out for that and we will of course be, um, be flagging that when that is available. So I want to thank uh, my co-authors and colleagues who've um, helped us immensely on this journey over many years. and. Uh, for their, without the input, this would not have been possible. Um, and I also want to particularly thank the National Center for Clinical Research on Emerging Drugs, NCRED, uh, who have very kindly uh, funded our research for the next year um, to help us take the next steps in, in this research. So thank you very much for your time today. I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, and in terms of contact, our details are available on the screen there. We're happy to take any questions um, or, or contact at any time. Thank you, James, for your very comprehensive um, presentation today. I have a number of um, questions from the audience. Uh, the first one being, what, in terms of the measures that you um, reviewed and you presented, was chronic disease a factor you considered? Uh, it is in the uh, formulation, so we always consider the um, things like um, cardiovascular or um, pulmonary or other uh, chronic medical conditions as part of our clinical formulations. Uh, and so they would have featured in some of those uh, categories uh, where I um, described the, the neuropsychology opinions for, for in that, uh, that first paper. Um, and they would have fitted under those uh, physical medical condition categories or potentially even the multiple contributing etiologies uh, category. Um, for our predictors paper though, um, that isn't a, a variable that we could have easily included in those modeling due to the variability and, and fairly low numbers of, of some of those medical conditions uh, and the wide variety of those medical conditions that are apparent. Um, but it is certainly something that we, we consider as part of our general formulations as well. In terms of this standard deviation of 1.3, how did you arrive at that cutoff? Uh, so this is, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and this is a, a, a definition that's a subject of a lot of debate within neuropsychology circles. Um, and is even something that came across in our, um, the, the feedback from reviewers on that paper. Uh, the reason we chose that figure was uh, it, it lines up with the, um, the categories for, uh, that, that are used by the Weschler Intelligence Scales, for instance, uh, which are based on uh, it, extremely low, borderline, low average, average, and so on, the categories of, of uh, functioning. Uh, 
uh, with borderline extremely low, uh, lining up with that 1.3 standard deviations below population norms. Uh, we elected to choose that option because it does represent um, a degree of uh, clinical um, difficulty on, on test performance that's not frequently seen in the general population. So we did feel it was important to represent this group rather than those just at that very extreme edge of, 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 uh, of difficulty as well. Uh, so that's why we elected to choose 1.3 standard deviations as opposed to um, you know, what others sometimes use would be um, you know, two standard deviations or, or higher. Um, so it was yeah, designed to reflect um, difficulties that individuals would be experiencing at that day-to-day -day level in terms of their, their functioning. We have a question about accessing neuropsychology. The first bit is um, about you know, how is it typically funded. The second bit is, is there access in terms of turning point? And the third bit is, is there capacity for those um, who um, sit under a refugee status to be able to ac access neuropsychology-based um, assessment and support? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, fun the assessments at turning point are funded, so we're a funded service. Um, which means that there's no cost to clients to be able to attend uh, for assessments with us. Uh, the catch with that is that we do have a fairly extensive wait list, um, usually sitting between six to ten months for a full assessment. Um, so so indiv individuals who meet our referral criteria, which I described in, the, um, here in those earlier slides, uh, would be eligible would, to uh, attend for, for our service. Um, and to, again, the same would apply to individuals with uh, refugee status or seeking asylum. Uh, again, they would be eligible to participate or, or engage in our services if, uh, if they met our referral criteria. We had a number of comments and questions about um, the recovery and other support provision for those who present with um, at-risk cognitive functioning. What are your thoughts in terms of that space? Um, yeah, so I would say there is always hope. Um, we would always encourage that, um, that there are things that you can do to support your cognitive functioning. Uh, and I guess the real theme of what, what we rec often recommend in the clinic is to really address those modifiable risk factors and really uh, seek to identify areas in which uh, uh, um, we could improve day-to-day -day functioning. Um, and things like mental health, uh, sleep, um, and getting them um, or your, any medical conditions well treated and generally aiming to improve quality of life on that front. Um, and there are, so, you know, as well, uh, you know, we often recommend just you know, focusing on good lifestyle um, routines and, and health, um, such as you know, getting exercise, uh, sleeping well, and getting appropriate nutrition as uh, all factors that can potentially improve uh, one's day-to-day um, -day functioning and potentially also cognitive functioning as well. Um, in terms of more severe difficulties, there, are, there is always hope through um, more specialised rehabilitation if, that services, if those are services that one can access, uh, which I do recognise is sometimes a challenge. Um, but there are lots of specialists out there, that, particularly in the rehab space, that can help with very specific difficulties or longer term difficulties on that front. We had a question about the education correlations um, and just inquiring about, um, about the protective factors in terms of a research identifying education and also um, completed ed education and what were the findings in, findings in that space? Yeah, again, so that's a really good question, a really good pick up on those interactions. And well, one of our interpretations on that front is uh, that that education interaction might reflect the severity of some of those developmental conditions as well. Um, so for instance, we would generally expect you know, maybe someone with an intellectual disability probably wouldn't um, attain the same number of years of education as maybe someone who with ADHD, for instance. Um, and so this, that interaction with uh, education might reflect that, um, that, that severity uh, there. Um, that said, we also know that education, that some cognitive domains and skills are really highly correlated with education, particularly um, skills in the verbal domain. So uh, it's not surprising at all that we would see a relationships with, uh, with education on that front for some of those variables as well. What was the prevalence of ADHD in, in your sample? Uh, again, a really good question and very topical. This is something we've been chatting about a lot in the clinic. Um, for us, the ADHD diagnosis space is a bit very challenging space, unfortunately, to, to work in because it often requires the opinion of a psychiatrist as well to provide that diagnosis. 
And at times it needs almost a, a medication trial as well to, to help see if that will uh, improve uh, one's symptoms. Um, so for us, it's not a diagnosis that we would often um, conv formally convey as part of our assessments. Uh, and instead, we'd often refer on to, uh, to psychiatry if that needed to be done. Um, and, and so in terms of the, the way that impacts the data is that uh, we would have noted down cases in which um, a formal diagnosis of ADHD was present within the history, but it's not something we would formally convey ourselves. So um, that's why we can't really comment on the prevalence of ADHD as a variable in, in itself because it's not something we would be too, uh, too sure on in terms of um, it, its prevalence in our group. But it certainly is a, a factor and, and did form part of that developmental condition um, uh, variable. Benzodiazepines and the use in, with, within the, the demographic of young people was a popular topic, topic in, the, in, in the commentary. And um, <coughs> additional to that, um, the, the dual use of benzodiazepine and alcohol and the accessibility from quite young ages. In terms of um, you know, using the expertise of the neuropsychology, what are some of the concerns you have um, associated with that use at such a young age, considering um, the risks of this? Um, so yeah, I would be very concerned about um, longer term use of benzodiazepines, particularly given that the clinical recommendations are, are generally limited to, to shorter term use only. Uh, and uh, some of the research, from, particularly from those meta-analyses that I cited, are quite clear that over, long -term, over the long term, um, heavier use is associated with, with poorer cognitive outcomes. So that is something I'd be particularly worried about. Um, indeed, in the clinic, we often say we're more worried generally about heavy alcohol use and heavy benzodiazepine use, uh, and probably a little bit less worried at times about some of the other illicit substances out there. Um, and it's interesting that those are often the, the, the two, those are generally the two legal ones compared to many other, other substances out there. Um, I will also say as well, one of the other concerns too, um, particularly for, for younger individuals, would be that risk of overdose uh, if they're combining use with, um, with alcohol or other uh, sedative, uh, sedating drugs um, and or medications. So again, yeah, the, the, the use of these medications um, does come with some very significant risks um, and we, that's why we really do encourage input from uh, addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine, for instance, just to ensure that the prescribing of these medications is appropriate. Uh, and we do have a real-time prescribing um, service available in Victoria as well um, that can be helpful as, as well for, for GPs and other health professionals to, to identify rates of prescribing there. Thank you. And the final question we have is in relation to trauma and the fact that it did not correlate in your cognitive measures um, to the degree of, um, of adverse child um, experience outcomes um, and studies where it is a mechanism of poor outcomes. What's your thoughts about that space? Um, yeah, again, a really good question. Um, and again, something we've been thinking a lot about as well. Um, I think for, for this data, it's probably just the way that um, a, the data is both coded and also uh, the, the completeness of it as well. Uh, as I said earlier on, I, I do wonder whether that 40% uh, rate of, of complex trauma histories is, is entirely accurate and whether it, it is potentially an underestimate, considering um, just how prevalent these histories are in, in AOD cohorts and the fact that there may be some limitation in, in you know, or limits in people, or what people are willing to disclose to us uh, as well. So it was a very, it's, it's a dichotomous variable that we used in, in our analysis. Uh, and I do wonder if uh, using more formal measures that uh, provide some degree of granularity around a severity of, of childhood experiences on that front uh, would be more useful in, in this type of analysis and more sensitive in capturing those contributions. Uh, and it's something we've considered for future work. At the same time though, we do have to balance that with, um, with needing to get a neuropsychology assessment done. Uh, so exploring that childhood history in too much detail uh, may in fact be counterproductive. So that's something we've been wrestling a lot with lately, uh, just in the last, last few weeks as well for, for future work. Thank you, James, for your time. Thanks very much.